Good afternoon, colleagues, partners, uh, participants, and welcome to the final session of our University of Pretoria Africa Week, which we are co-hosting with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So over the past um, two days, we've had compelling dialogue around reimagining our universities, making a difference and measuring impact. Now we're coming to the tough stuff. How do we turn exciting thoughts and ideas into practice? And to do this, we've crafted a series of leadership conversations to help us on the journey ahead. We start off with a welcome video recording from Prof. Sheikh Mbo, our Director of Future Africa, uh, where we are currently sitting. Uh, this flows into a leadership dialogue with our panel of experts, uh, Ms. Maria Cortespo, Professor Lobode Popula, and Ms. Caroline Makasa. I'll introduce them more formally at the start of the dialogue. <coughs> Professor Jeffrey Sachs will join us in the course of our conversation and he will share some of his reflections. Finally, our session will, of session along with the broader Africa Week series of events will then be closed by our own Vice Chancellor, Professor Tawana Kupe. So with a full hour ahead, let's get stuck into our meeting and I'll introduce Professor Sheikh Mbo, uh, who will be on video um, to give him a welcome to everybody. He's the Director of Future Africa and through his professional career has been deeply involved in sustainable development. He's worked in Africa and the United States and has expertise in sustainability transformation and climate change. Now, a characteristic of Sheikh is that he inherently believes that through research and education, Africa has the profound potential to build capability and create the solutions we need for our transformation as a continent. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Future Africa Institute. Thank you, VC, for making this happen and to meet with Prof. Jeffrey Sachs to the SDSN and the Vice Chancellors and our colleagues from the SDG Center for Africa. We are interested in this discussion just for three main points. One is discussing with SDGs and the transformation that Africa needs. And that leads to an important discussion that we need to have is the set of partnership we need to establish to make that transformation happen. And lastly, how we at Future Africa, we contribute to that transformation and make sure that the SDGs are happening and implemented in Africa in a proper manner. To the first point, when we talk about transformation at Future Africa, we think of deep and rapid transformation for Africa deep and rapid transformation, just because we only have nine years to go and the mountain to climb is so high. If you take the dashboard of SDSN, Africa is lagging behind, not only in the achievement of information that are needed for the SDGs, but also to the space of implementation of those SDGs. Definitely the university and academia and the research should do something to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. Transformation is not always transactional is a shift in a mindset of communities, of our society, and that requires a number of new things, new rationale, new concept, new governance structure, new funding. And all those areas are knowledge intensive. We need to question what science says about it. But at the same time, we also have to be realistic that academia is not the stronghold of all knowledge that exists in society. There are so many important information that we need to grasp from society and reverse the relationship that the university has with society. And Future Africa is contributing to that transformation by creating a space where the framework of finding come and meet the framework of action, where the people who are doing policies and implementing you know, development paradigms come to meet the researchers who are working on the discovery and innovation. And that's the reason why this is absolutely key to discuss the ways this connection is important and this partnership is important. To do that, we have established a number of structural elements at Future Africa. One of them, which is very key to this discussion, is a set of six research chairs on transformative areas, on reconnecting Africa, on transdisciplinarity knowledge and sustainability science, on One Health and all many others, human rights, etc. And embracing the diversity of those requirements to achieve the SDGs would likely create a community of practice, which is both university members, but also policymakers. And we're looking forward 
because of this panel composed by all those sensitivities to get new aspirations, to get new perspectives and analyze them in order to address this deep and rapid acceleration that we need in Africa in order to achieve the SDGs. I wish you well and looking forward to the conclusion of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, so one of the things that, that um, was quite striking around uh, both the two days that we've come through and uh, Sheikh's conversation is that reimagining the transformation is multifaceted. It has multiple dimensions. Um, and, and, and it's inherently dealing with complexity. And it's a tough task. And, and as we shift from the reimagining to the transformation, we've, we've got to grapple with that and figure out what we're going to do. And I think we're pretty much breaking new ground. Um, we, we're covering new territory. And to help us along with that, we've got a panel of uh, three experts from, again, multiple, uh, many different uh, dimensions. So, so we have Maria Cortez, uh, who is the Vice President of Networks at the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We have Professor um, Labode Popula, who is the um, Vice Chancellor at the University of Osun in Nigeria. And we have um, Ms. Makasa, Caroline Makasa, who is um, the acting director of the SDG uh, Network uh, Center in Rwanda. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off with um, our first uh, panelist, uh, Maria. So Maria is the vice president of networks in the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And in this role, she leads the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network's efforts to build a global network of universities, research centers, and civil society organizations. The network pursues sustainable development innovation at local levels through research, public education, executive training, demonstration products, and the convening of social stakeholders and incubation initiatives. Maria holds a BSc and MSc degrees in physics from Complutense University in Madrid and a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University. Welcome, Maria, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tixin. Um, and congratulations on this wonderful workshop and such a pertinent topic. Um, as, as you were saying at the beginning, we have just nine years to achieve the SDGs. We have also an increased understanding of the urgency of addressing climate change. And now we have the COVID-19 pandemic upon us. So the, the need to greatly expand society's capacity to resolve and to address these complex challenges is more important and more urgent than ever. And at SDSN, we agree with what has just been said. We think that universities are the best placed institutions to tackle this challenge. Universities are the world's leading multidisciplinary knowledge centers, and they can help diagnose complex challenges as well as propose multidimensional solutions. Universities are educating the leaders of the future and hundreds of millions of them. And universities are indispensable in the role of fostering both technological but also governing uh, innovations. And then finally, universities are, are ideally placed to convene various stakeholders. Uh, they have the expertise, the independence, the social trust, a long-term perspective. All of these are essential uh, to achieving the SDGs. So this puts universities in a unique position. However, uh, I think it has been very clearly said already, the scale and the pace required by the challenges of sustainable development is so vast that continuing to do what we're already doing will not be enough, even if what we're doing is great. Um, the SDGs call for deep transformations and for, uh, and, and for transformations everywhere. So incremental approaches will not be enough. It's very interesting. Um, that you've talked about reimagining because Otto Scharmer was recently in a workshop that we organized around this topic. And he was saying that most institutions, not just universities, but companies and even governments are thinking about addressing our current challenges 
just by optimizing what they were already doing. Instead of reimagining, using exactly the same work as you did, what we could be doing differently, what else could we be doing and how could we be doing differently. There, I, I want to refer to the sustainable development report that the University of Pretoria has recently published uh, because there you have a matrix that proposes two drivers of success when addressing sustainable development. And I could not agree more on these two. First of all, it's the nature of our engagement and the relationships that we establish to address these challenges. What kind of partnerships are we, uh, are we setting up? And the second is the, the, the nature of the knowledge and of the solutions that we develop to address these challenges. And so the report proposes that we need to move from very transactional relationships that have a narrow uh, set of solutions that are very siloed, most likely producing just incremental changes, to transformative relationships, Trans transformative relationships where we are co-designing, co-creating and co-owning very multifaceted uh, solutions. And these solutions have most likely uh, the common good as the ultimate goal. This is exactly what we believe at SDSN. We are mobilizing academia. We are establishing these transformational partnerships with stakeholders from around the world and from different sectors. And we're co-designing complex solutions around a shared purpose, the achievement of the, the SDGs. And how do we facilitate this method of achieving the SDGs? Um, well, first of all, we have this massive network of universities. Um, we currently have 1,400 um, member institutions, most of them universities, for, uh, from 160 different countries. Um, our networks, uh, sorry, our members contribute to our work, our, our programs, our design of solutions, pathways, our reports, and we also create spaces for these members to interact with each other, such as, for example, the International Conference for Sustainable Development. Our members also work um, and organize themselves in national and regional networks, of which we have 41. And these networks focus on three objectives. The first one is localizing the SDGs. So they work, the universities of one country work together with their governments, their uh, private sector, as well as, uh, as well as civil society, on thinking through what does this agenda mean for us? What are the specific challenges for our country? What are areas where we need more granular data to really evaluate whether we're making progress? Our networks are also promoting high quality education as well as research collaboration for sustainable development. And finally, our networks are vetting and launching solution initiatives, including the support of preparation of long term pathways. These long term pathways are just very technical modeling exercises that prove that achieving the SDGs is in fact uh, possible. And while it's a very uh, technical exercise, it's done in collaboration with civil society that contributes to alert whether we're leaving anyone behind, as well as the industry that can map out potential trade-offs that the model has not realized. So again, done in a very, uh, very multi-stakeholder approach. Our networks are led by local leaders, and I'm very happy to see that we have uh, Professor Popula today, our chair of our Nigerian network, one of our most active networks. And our networks um, are also working with us on a number of tools that we put forward for um, members to use the SDGs as a framework for transformation. We published three years ago a report called how to, use, how to Get Started with the SDGs in Universities. And we've most recently published a, a new guide called Accelerating Education for the SDGs in Universities that focuses on how universities can help learners develop the necessary knowledge, skills, but also mindsets. I could not agree more with our uh, previous speaker. We do need to change our mindset if we are to confront these challenges in a completely different way, if we are to be able to, to enter these multi-stakeholder partnerships and to propose um, and co-create these, sol these multifaceted solutions. Um, we, we developed these uh, reports with the help of many universities from around the world that send case studies of how they're doing things differently. And we're going to be opening a call for new case studies towards the end of this month. So what we're looking for right now is either very innovative approaches to teaching the SDGs 
or ways in which universities are mainstreaming the SDGs throughout the whole university. Let me just conclude by saying that while we were writing this guide, we, we kept coming back to the question of um, the, the, the scale and the pace of the change that is needed. And, and the conclusion that we were reaching is that while we have a lot going on around the world, it is probably not at the right pace and scale. And therefore, once again, universities do need to undergo a deep transformation. This is why we left the last chapter of the guide for this particular pro uh, problem. We confronted it with a lot of humility because as you were saying, this is a tremendously complex question. There are uh, numerous barriers um, and, and also universities are set up in a specific way to keep their independence, to be able to provide the high quality uh, services that they do for society. So this is not an easy question. But in this last chapter, we propose some ideas on how this is happening around the world. We also showcase four different cases from Australia, from Malaysia, from Spain, and from uh, South Africa, uh, specifically from the University of Pretoria, that I think could serve as inspiration for other universities. So I encourage you to look into that. But this is a, an open question. We've hosted a number of workshops on this topic and we will be publishing small uh, briefs on, on these addressing specific questions such as, for example, what would be appropriate regulatory frameworks to address uh, this transformation or what are the key and most urgent aspects that universities need to transform. So we're very humble about it. Uh, I agree with you. This is a tremendously complicated question and I'm very eager to hear today what our other speakers have to say and to and to read up the conclusions of these two uh, very exciting days. Once again, thank you for organizing this um, and congratulations. Thank, thank, thank you, Maria. Um, just listening to that, um, that conversation, um, what, what strikes me is that we, we commonly use the word transformation in a very glib uh, way and we talk transformation without really understanding its implications. And, and yes, transformation is not um, continuous improvement. It's, it's a radical change and a radical disruption that is required um, in the face of the challenges we face and the future that we'd like to create. Now, in that sense, uh, transformation needs to start from within. And, and Maria has given us an indication of some of the areas uh, where we would look at transfer, transforming, uh, particularly around our core functions uh, in university, in research and education, etc. cetera. And, and with that, I'd like to go on to Prof. Uh, Labodi, um, who's the Vice Chancellor of the University of Osun and the Director of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network in Nigeria. So, so Prof. Labodi's role as Vice-Chancellor, um, or in his role as Vice-Chancellor, he's actively working uh, on transforming the University of Osun into a model university with a meaningful impact on society. Uh, Prof. Labodi is a renowned academic, and of note, his fields of study are firmly in the sustainable development space, with a previous appointment as Professor of Forest Economics. He, he's a, a prolific publisher, and has over 150 publications and has been presented with numerous awards. He also plays a leadership role in many notable professional bodies uh, across the continent. Welcome, Lobody, and thank you for joining us. Now, going into your dialogue, I mean, flowing from the work that you've been doing uh, at the University of Osun and, and what we are collectively undertaking on reimagining universities in complex and uncertain times, what are your reflections on how universities can transform? to turn these reimagined ideas and intentions into reality. Well, thank you very much, uh, Brian. And um, I would also want to appreciate uh, Sheikh Mbou and uh, uh, Maria for her insightful presentation. Uh, there's no doubt we are living in very complex and uncertain times, and uh, so many things are happening around the world. Um, Africa is not left behind. Uh, we have uh, population growing and leaps and bounds. Uh, climate change is a big, big issue. We have ecosystem decline, and there are surprises almost on a daily basis. COVID-19, of course, is one of the surprises. And so what this truly tells us is that 
we cannot be business as usual. So we have to reimagine how the university system will continue to run so that we can be relevant to the rest of the society. Now, my own thoughts about this is that, yeah, over the years, universities have been doing this business as usual way of doing things. Uh, I'm happy that Sheikh said, said earlier on that we are not just uh, the only knowledge uh, pro providers. Uh, we can find knowledge from other places. Uh, even the ordinary people on the streets also have some knowledge. But over the years, we've had this arrogance of feeling that the universities are only the knowledge givers or the knowledge creators or the knowledge providers. So it's always been business as usual. But my thinking, and this is what we're trying to do in my university, is that it should no longer be business as usual. So what exactly do we think we should be doing if we have to be, re be relevant to the rest of the society, if we have to reimagine universities, if we have to be a transformational uh, institution? The first one is that we have to respect our clients and who are clients, our students, the parents, the community within which we operate. We need to respect them. Uh, most times, those of us in the university system think that we're high up there, we know it all, and we don't seem to respect our stakeholders. So first and foremost, it's important that we respect our clients to go into advocacy and lobbying. Uh, universities don't usually have uh, lobbying skills. If you have to deal with the rest of the society, if you have to get information from people, if you have to work with people, you must have what I call lobbying and advocacy skill. So we need to understand the business language, the language of the society. I mean, we cannot stand up there and think that we can do it alone. We need to understand the language of the society. And uh, so it's not just about laboratories, it's not just about conferences. Let's speak the language of the ordinary man on the street. Uh, of course, we also try to problem analysis, but I'm not very sure our problem analysis are always very thorough. We need to have thorough problem analysis. And we have to involve stakeholders. You, see, you cannot do thorough problem analysis without involving stakeholders. Stakeholders have to be carried along, start from the bottom. If you're dealing with farmers, you, know, you need to know what the problems of the farmers are. If you're dealing with manufacturers, you need to know what their problems are. So you <clears throat> need to do thorough problem analysis. Then uh, multidisciplinary has become a buzzword. Whether we like it or not, again, silos, gone are the days of the silos. So we need to have multidisciplinary teams. And the Sustainable Development Goals makes this mandatory. There are 17 goals. None of them can stand alone. They are not divisible. They are all interconnected. They are all interlinked. So it's not possible for you to say you are a geographer or you are a chemist and you want to work alone. We need multidisciplinary teams. And of course, they don't have to be too many. If there are too many, they become confusing. So we also need partnership. Gladly, one of the key goals in the Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 17, is about partnerships. So we need to have partnership. And uh, when you're talking about partnership, there has to be objectives. Uh, equity becomes an important thing, mutual benefit, uh, transparency. And uh, we also need to start thinking beyond national. Uh, quite a number of universities, particularly in West Africa, are becoming local and national universities. To look at the regional level. In Africa, we have to start thinking about Nepal. We have to start, start thinking about AU. West Africa, we have to start thinking about ECOWAS. And we have to start thinking about our problems. But we also have to look beyond our immediate localities. Now, it's also important, if we have to be relevant, we have to be transformational, that we're able to disseminate our messages as universities, okay? You have to be able to disseminate I mean, our messages, and these messages must be consistent. The messages must be consistent. They must be knowledge-rich to our target audience. It's not just about publishing. Publishing, yes, very do you disseminate what you're publishing? 
Knowledge sharing, very important. Knowledge management, very important. Information transfer is very important. And for us to be able to do this equitably and very well, we need to involve policymakers. Policymakers can make or mar whatever achievements are in the university. So we have to approach them very cautiously. Uh, the press is very important, the media, good information packages from us, how they can reach out to the target audience. Policy formulation, yes, at the university level, we need to formulate policies, but we have to make it participatory. Now, the universities, particularly in this part of the world, are always very cautious about politicians. Uh, I, politicians are also human beings. We need to approach them, we need to respect them, we need to work them if we have to be transformational. The end users of our products, of research, actually at times I have discovered that they are smarter than us in the university. And we need to find a way of learning from them. And finally, I think we have to start looking at uh, building sustainability into whatever we do. Um, Miriam uh, mentioned that Aaron, there is little sustainability in what we do in the university. If somebody starts something, when we build stability into what we do, we find ways of scaling it up. Now we are in the era of big data. We have to start thinking of how do we accumulate data, data that will be useful for the future. We are in and uh, also finally a building is very we are not very good at that in the university so that's why we are caught unawares most of the times we have to build a resilient whatever we do and uh, i like to say that uh, up this way um if some questions come up, I, I can address them. Congratulate the University of Victoria. Congratulate Brian and his team, as well as my co-panelists. Uh, very good afternoon once again. Okay. Thank, thank you, Prof. Uh, Lobode. Um, I mean, that, there, there's certainly a lot, a lot of content in that and a lot of food for thought. But just a, a couple of the messages that I'm, I'm pulling out from this here is that, well, certainly it's no longer business as usual. But part of the the issues about it being no longer business as usual are that, firstly, and a very common theme that came out from uh, Maria's uh, message is that humility is important. Okay? And, and my interpretation there is that um, we must be human. And, and that is the start of us being humanistic. Um, it's important that we value people and we value the different sources of knowledge and their perspectives. And that mm -hmm. sets us up to be in touch with them and speak the, a language that the different stakeholders can understand. Um, we need to be building relationships that are underpinned by trust and embed transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity into the way we do things, but with critical priorities and do it in a way that we focus on renewal and resilience. Okay. Now, I'm going to move on to our last uh, panel speaker, Ms. Caroline Makasa. Now, Caroline is the acting director of the STG Center for Africa, based in Rwanda. Um, and it's an international organization that supports governments, civil society, businesses, and academic institutions to accelerate progress towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals in Africa. Uh, now, Caroline holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the Uni University of Namibia and a master's in science in sustainable development from the University of London. She has extensive experience in market development, capacity building, and establishing high-level partnerships. Welcome, Caroline, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you very much, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think this is an exciting topic, and I think also it's coming, I think, timely when the world has witnessed you know, a real you know, shift in how everything is done that you know, we can no longer rely on doing things the way we've previously been doing them. 
And so I think, you know, this is a really timely um, discussion. And I think, you know, I want to thank everybody, including those that have spoken before me, because I think, you know, some of it are thinking, oh, okay, this is interesting, you know. Um, I want to start first by just, you know, just reflecting on, you know, when I did my master's in sustainable development, I remember I was searching for a university. This was like maybe, this was like 11 years ago. And I couldn't really find a university in Africa where I could actually study sustainable development. But I was able to find a university overseas. And, you know, when I did uh, my MSc in sustainable development, it was really, then it was really kind of, you know, a very new topic, still a new topic, and also still a topic that people question to say, why are you doing this? But at that time, you know, I, I, I was fully involved in, in trade and investment. And people couldn't understand why I wanted to do, you know, sustainable development. And it had all these wide ranging courses, you know, from ecology to, to design and innovation to really topics that you wouldn't think would be part of, you know, I mean, it was it was such at that time, a bit of a strange curriculum, but uh, the more you dived into it, the more you, you, you began to, under, to, to understand. So Innovation, I think, is the start of everything. I mean, when I listen to everyone and I think, you know, as long as we're not willing to be innovative, then I think we are. We will always, we will always lag behind. I mean, transformation is all about leadership. You know, leadership is also about change. Sometimes we have to be very, you know, dynamic. We have to, to do things that we've never done before. I mean, we are not all doing things we've never done before. We have people who are working at home. You know, in the past, this was something which was inconceivable to work at home. You had to, you know, it was not something that was practiced. You actually had to be in an office and so on. So all these, I think Africa needs really a, 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 a change in the way we think, a change in the way we do things. But also I agree that we really need to appreciate those that we work with. I think even African universities need to change the way they do things. A lot of the African universities are still very closed. Some of them, it takes them, you know, many, many years to even transform or change even a curriculum. Um, so maybe just to tell you a bit about what the center has been, you know, been doing in the area of tertiary education. Um, we, we've had dialogues. One of the biggest dialogues that we had was where we were able to mobilize and have representatives, high level representatives from various tertiary ed educational institutions within Africa. And at the end of that uh, big conference that we had, uh, there was a a plan, a roadmap that was uh, developed. One of our just, try, you know, just named some of the, the targets in that roadmap. One of them was that, you know, to have at least 25 universities in Africa to be listed among the top 300 universities globally. Um, and also another one was, you know, to create a robust network of African vice chancellors championing higher educational reform agenda in Africa. These were just some of them. And basically the roadmap was aimed at creating interventions to enhance the teaching and learning process, to build competitive business regimes within universities, to perform transformational leadership in universities, build competitive uh, research capacity in, in universities, and to nurture and support you know, strong and effective outreach uh, programs. Um, this program stalled a little bit, but it's something that we are reviving. But one of the practical things that the center has now embarked on is to have interns. We have partnerships now with some universities, some in Africa. One of them is African Leadership University. And another one is Syracuse University in, in, uh, in New York, is to have them come to the center and gain practical experience, you know, about SDGs and also how to solve problems. Because I think sometimes, you know, the curriculum is such is so textbook and students are not able to, you know, to, to solve problems. And really um, sustainability is about, you know, it's practical things, it's everyday problems, but some of them also require an innovative approach to be able to resolve these problems. So this is one of the things that we've started. I mean, we'll actively have some uh, students joining us actually in May. So each cycle will have, uh, we'll have students coming for a period of about two to three months. Some may stay longer, maybe four, maybe four months, but I think we have to make things practical. And I agree uh, with, with, with the professor that spoke before me that, you know, we have to uh, 
universities have to build partnerships outside of the walls of universities and look very broad and, and, and have a very broad view of how to do things because SDGs themselves are quite complex. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm still grappling with, with uh, the nature of the transformation that we, that we need to go through. Um, so we use words like innovation, transdisciplinarity, commonly and frequently. But what I'm, what I'm trying to, to get at, and I don't think we're necessarily going to resolve it at this particular session, but how do we embed these and hardwire them into the way we do things around here? As, as universities, how do we make them part and parcel of our fabric and part and parcel of our culture? How do we have a culture of transdisciplinarity? How do we create cultures of innovation so that that enables us to be resilient? But leaving that question, I um, would like to announce that we are honored, truly honored to have Professor Jeffrey Sachs with us today. And I'd like to warmly welcome him. Um, he really doesn't need any introduction from me. And to be honest, I don't believe that going through his resume uh, will do any real justice to him. It's freely available. But what I will say is that Jeffrey Sachs is a globally renowned champion of sustainable development and the SDGs. He represents thought leadership and is a significant contributor to the path that the world seeks to pursue and the path that we are seeking to pursue. He pushes the boundaries and is an inspiration. Welcome, Jeffrey, and thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, what a thrill and honor to be with the university leaders across Africa. Uh, thanks, uh, Caroline, uh, for your leadership of the SDG Center for Africa. And uh, let me tell you how much I hope I can contribute to your deliberations. I, I do believe that uh, Africa's universities uh, should be playing uh, a vanguard role in a massive and rapid transformation of Africa to a knowledge society. And I think universities have a, a unique opportunity to do this as well. We know that we need change at an unprecedented speed. There are so many challenges. Uh, the world is uh, disrupted profoundly. Uh, technologically, geopolitically, environmentally, uh, pandemics uh, were really in uh, very unstable and very fast changing times. And I believe that uh, we need to have uh, well educated and trained populations in order to be able to survive and thrive. Uh, in such times. I'm, I'm watching uh, the unfolding disaster in the United States, for example, of COVID-19, uh, where we have 525,000 deaths so far. And it's clearly because uh, our former president and much of the public doesn't have the scientific knowledge to be able to behave properly uh, in the face of uh, a crisis like this. Uh, whereas uh, in East Asian countries where education is much better, uh, public uh, knowledge of science is much better, government leadership is more technically trained, the epidemic was brought under control quickly. So I believe that as uh, society's core knowledge institutions, universities absolutely need to play a fundamental and leadership role. I also think that in the African context, we need to think about how to massively scale up access to higher education. And I personally am persuaded that online education is a key part of that. And I would love to hear the views of uh, the vice chancellors, uh, and uh, what the various campuses are doing. Maybe uh, I, there's not agreement on this, but I believe that if we could get digital access to more of the population, we could also have low cost mass education 
on a scale that is unimaginable in the past. You know, it's just a lot less expensive to provide uh, core learning online than it is uh, on campuses. Not that it should be all one way or another, certainly. I love campuses. I've uh, lived on a campus uh, basically for the last uh, 49 years, if you can believe it, <laughs> since entering college. I've never left uh, living on a campus. Uh, but I do believe that online education offers an opportunity that is unprecedented to reach more young people, uh, to provide education at a lower cost. I know that uh, the cost of on-campus learning in the United States is probably, I would estimate, 25 times more expensive on campus than it is online. So I think we could do something unprecedented uh, in uh, mass education if we put our minds to it. And I would love to work with the universities <laughs> in any way that the Sustainable Development Solutions Network could be helpful to you. I'm speaking also with entrepreneurs about all online master's degree programs and other programs. And uh, this could be something that uh, a network of universities in Africa take up on a shared basis to, and maybe it's already happening as far as I know, but I do think that there's a tremendous opportunity here. Of course, uh, it's almost trite to say, but it's probably worth saying that universities play several fundamental roles in society. Uh, of course, they teach and educate. This is uh, number one. Second is engage in serious research that no other part of society has the capacity, time, interest, or motivation to do. So research activities, of course, businesses do it to some extent. Governments, pretty li very little. Uh, most of the rest of society, not so much. It remains to the universities to be the uh, knowledge creators and uh, the in-depth uh, analyzers of trends. A third area is incubation of business. Uh, we know that uh, each of the major universities can become a hub for startup businesses that are innovative and directed towards problem solving. And uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that turned out to be mainly the biotech sector. In uh, Stanford and San Francisco, that turned out to be uh, the digital technologies. Uh, in Pittsburgh, it turned out to be robotics uh, organized around uh, Carnegie Mellon University and so on. So I think that the African universities can be incubators of new businesses uh, and that this is an extremely important role to play. And the fourth area, in addition to the teaching, the research, the incubation of business, is the advising of governments. And I find governments more and more aware that they need to cooperate with universities in order to address problems. This isn't automatic. Uh, it depends on the leader. Trump, who was a, a fool uh, and a dangerous man, uh, had no, uh, you know, absolutely no interest in universities, uh, but that's because he was a nut uh, and a completely irresponsible president. Uh, now we're seeing a, a greatly stepped up role of American universities, even in the early days of the Biden administration. But I would say across Africa, there are many governments that would reach out to universities for working on problem solving on key areas. I think uh, when the question is what should universities do uh, to move beyond the slogans uh, and so forth of interdisciplinarity and so on, the question is what are the major problems that need to be addressed? And I would say uh, that the major problems uh, in the African context are, are clear. Uh, one is uh, obviously uh, major transformations uh, in energy to uh, mass 
uh, electrification based on uh, Africa's uh, wonderful renewable energy potential, mass digital uh, inclusion, given the role that digital technologies potentially could play for education, for healthcare, for governance, for finance and payments, for agriculture, for sustainable uh, monitoring and so forth. So I would hope that Africa would see, uh, in African countries and universities would see the digital revolution as a blockbuster set of technologies that would uh, greatly empower uh, speedy development uh, in the region and offer new kinds of services, telemedicine, distance learning, uh, digital currencies and e-payments and so forth that could really uh, tremendously accelerate uh, overall sustainable development uh, in, in the region. I found uh, when I was uh, heading the Earth Institute at Columbia University, which is a transdisciplinary unit of the university, that the thing that brought the different disciplines together was not a, a slogan or a motto or even a shared commitment to sustainable development. It was specific problem solving. So it was challenges of the energy transition or uh, challenges of sustainable land use or challenges of digital of urban digital transformation that got uh, researchers from uh, different disciplines, legal, business, uh, engineering, uh, and so forth to work together. Because when you're solving a problem, uh, when you're addressing a societal need, the disciplines uh, obviously take a back seat to uh, the difficult, uh, uh, complicated problem that you're confronting. And you realize quite soon you need many kinds of expertise working together to untie the knot uh, or to uh, pass through the labyrinth uh, of actions that are needed. So my basic question and uh, uh, hope is how could we, uh, and how could I help, of course, in, my, uh, in whatever modest way that SDSN could, but how could uh, the African universities lead to a massive scale up of access to higher education at an unprecedented speed to make up for lost time? Uh, to recognize the centrality of knowledge and training in the new technologies. Uh, to what extent would online, to what extent would cross-country partnerships, to what extent would an Africa-wide network, to what extent would enhanced financing all help to play a role for the massive scale-up of education? Second, uh, what can be done uh, in order to support the practical problem solving uh, through the university curricula, the research agenda, and the actions together with government. A third question for me, do you share my feeling that the digital breakthroughs and digital technologies are a kind of organizing principle by training uh, young Africans in digital uh, skills in, uh, of, of course, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, 3D printing, <laughs> uh, coding and software, uh, digital entrepreneurship, digital startups and so forth, that this is as promising as it seems to me, at least, because I think that with these new technologies, uh, many, many parts of the economy could benefit uh, tremendously uh, and, and with a, a, a very rapid uptake. So these are questions that I would like to pose back to the chancellors, uh, but I want to uh, end by saying that um, I, I find this uh, challenge of the uh, massive uh, support, scale up quality, 
of Africa's institutions of higher education as being central, perhaps the most important uh, leading edge of the rapid sustainable development transformation of Africa. So uh, anything I can do to help, uh, I want you to count on me personally and count on the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And I know uh, speaking uh, alongside Caroline, uh, count on the SDG Center for Africa uh, for this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Prof. Sachs. I'm, I'm going to just um, highlight some of the key takeaways that I, I got from, from what you're saying. And then I'm going to pass you on to Prof. Coupe, who will talk in a little bit more detail around the digital transformation and leverage of digital technology around effective education and research and uh, scaling that. But, you know, some, some points that, that really struck me are that you said African universities should play or to play a vanguard role. And I like that because the, the continent is ours, the challenges are ours, and so must be the solutions. And surely we have the ability to respond in relation to the work that we do. That's research, education, policy, advice, and influence, and translation that you, that you, that you highlighted, such as incubation. Okay. I'm also interested in your idea, um, and, and we certainly are going to pursue it in the University of Pretoria, around embedding transdisciplinarity and innovation by design, by focusing on specific challenges. And I think to a large extent that is happening. Uh, we have the Arua Centers of Excellence that do focus on specific African challenges, um, and they, by design, force transdisciplinary conversations. Okay? Um, and this can then also shape the research and education agenda. Around the virtual and online learning and use of digital technology for mass education and more effective education, Prof. Kupe, your thoughts? Well, I think the, the issue is not whether it's, a, it's an opportunity or not. It is an opportunity which we have to grapple by the neck, if you like. The issue really is, and I'm glad that you say you are offer your own personal and other networks to, to assist with this. Here's the problem, absolutely, is, and here I speak from a privileged position, that my university doesn't exactly have the problem. You, I'm quite sure you know of the digital divide that exists between the North and the South, but and the South being as the global South as uh, the terminology goes. But the problem is that too many universities on the African continent are not actually connected to the extent that they can do decent every day without thinking about digital teaching and learning of any kind. And, and we saw this last year. So, so, so a lot, uh, 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 lots of universities fell behind. In South Africa, which is considered to have a much better economy than others, we have 26 public universities. Uh, our academic calendar runs from January to December. Only 10 of the universities could, uh, after a hard lockdown, go online effectively and complete the academic year in 2020. Many are still about to complete the academic year 2020, but the academic year 2021 has started. So you have that, that the pro and, and the simple reason was that they were not digitally connected. They didn't, uh, the, 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 the kinds of students they enroll come from such backgrounds that they don't own an internet connected device. And also the university itself does not have a teaching and learning management system that can deliver effective, high quality education. Because what you don't want as well is to repeat the some kinds of analog teaching and learning that we've had in Africa, which, are, which is not quality teaching and a high quality education does not deliver the skills that uh, industry or even the public service actually needs. So the challenge is how do we get, and I like the point you made earlier on is that this could be a project where you digitally connect all of the African universities and by the way, the schools as well, because we get our, like you do, we get our students from the high schooling system. If they are not connected, they will not be digitally literate. So something that wires for uh, uh, all of the, the, the schooling system or the education system and, and also enables them, as you rightly said, and I put it in a document I wrote, co-authored last year to my colleagues, uh, the 26 vice chancellors, when COVID hit, I co-wrote uh, with my director of institutional planning 
a document called Reimagining Higher Education in South Africa. Oh. One of the yeah. things I proposed in that document was uh, that we should actually have shared IT resources and other services. On the back of those shared resources, we could also develop co-design co and develop common courses that we could teach together uh, because also our capacities are not always what they should be. So, 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 so just the cost of, of going online is very expensive. I'm in a different situation even among the more privileged universities. My faculty and students could go online for teaching and learning without purchasing data. My the rest of my colleagues had to purchase data at very high cost. I'm quite sure you know, Prof. Sachs, that uh, data costs in Africa are too high. They're higher that they can't, they're inaffordable. They ex exacerbate the, even in South Africa, they exacerbate the digital divide. So, so we'd also need to have a cooperation from the telecommunications companies who are largely monopolies, if you like, to be able to think of the greater common good and interest, lower the data prices, contribute to wiring up or digitizing the, university, the schooling and the university system. We did hold, I was part of a small team of four vice chancellors who met with some of the telcos to try and say, could you create a, a digital backbone for all of the universities? The discussions didn't go anyway. Uh, confidentially, one of them said, no, okay, if I do it on an exclusive basis, I will do it for you guys. But we actually didn't want to embed anti-competitive behavior and also the entrenchment of a monopoly in the system. So, 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 let me put it this way as well is, there's no way in which Africa could achieve the sustainable development goals or develop any further if it does not join the digital revolution, if digital transformations do not happen. I see it at my university where out of 55,000 students, we ended up only having to support under 4,000 students. To, we bought them laptops, let me be just blunt. But because we had a sophisticated digital system that didn't need data, everybody was online doing both synchronous and asynchronous uh, teaching and learning. And we saw that there was better performance by, by, by in, in both semesters of last year than when we were a hybrid version with the online but largely in contact in class mode. Let me also end by saying uh, digitization and digital education and connection is very important. But getting an education also is much more than sitting behind a computer. So what we would like to do at Investor of Pretoria is to innovate around a strong online component, but which is a fairly nuanced and calibrated, if you like, face-to-face -face contact modes to teach some of the skills you need in the 21st century. Collaboration, cultural sensitivity, emotional intelligence, engagement, and so on. But yes, a, a largely on the back of, a, of an online platform and, and, and differentiated. Professional students, postgraduate students might do everything online, but undergraduates might need some contact classes, small tutorial, debate groups, syndicates, group discussions, and that kind of stuff. Wow, it's so inspiring. Uh, thank you very much. Can, uh, can I get a copy of your uh, 2019 report or 2020 report? Uh, if, if you would email that, that would be fantastic. But I wonder whether it would be possible to put together a project of uh, connecting all African universities. And we could think about a second section connecting all African high schools, uh, which I think would be uh, also quite thrilling. I don't know what the price tag of that might be, but uh, I have in mind uh, some billionaires, uh, foundations and so on that should take that up. Uh, because I, I would imagine for some hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, it would be possible to uh, essentially get the, uh, the physical infrastructure in place. And uh, the billionaires today, uh, of course, uh, Bezos and his foundation, that's $200 billion of personal wealth. And uh, Google, uh, Gates Foundation, Microsoft, uh, this should not be such a big hurdle to get done quickly, actually, if there was, a, and I think the attractiveness of an Africa-wide proposal, if it's feasible without uh, huge, huge headaches, uh, to put something in place to say all 
universities uh, should be uh, digitally connected. I, I really think that is uh, both necessary and could attract support. And if not those foundations, uh, it could be uh, Chinese government, it could be Japan, it could be others. Uh, it would just be interesting to try to do that. That would be number one for me. Second, uh, I'd love your advice on uh, not only data access, but access to online journals uh, and scientific information. You know, uh, when I log on to my Columbia University system, I have access, I would estimate, to about 50,000 journals, free, instantaneously available. I would imagine that few African universities have any kind of access such as that. But it does seem to me that we should be able to organize an effort that that online access is either made available for free or at a enormously discounted set of prices for the African universities. Because of course, the marginal cost of providing that access is literally zero uh, or almost zero. So I think that the a chance for a massive extension of access to the online scientific and other journals would be very good. But I'd love your advice on that because I don't really know the situation that, uh, say, University of Pretoria or other universities face in terms of that kind of access. And then when it comes to data, I do think we should go to GSMA, uh, the global uh, the, the, the global uh, association of, uh, of uh, telecoms uh, providers, uh, to my mind, uh, they need to come back with an answer uh, for uh, the universities that is not simply pay your commercial prices or negotiate on your own, but something more systematic. And I think the Secretary General of the UN could well uh, get involved in that. I can't speak for him but he has a roadmap on digital inclusion that calls for universal digital access. And I would like to take up this idea of data access for the universities with the Secretary General, also with UNESCO, uh, which obviously has a mandate for ensuring uh, education for all. And where else would one start with the apex but with the Apex Education Institutions. So uh, Professor Coupe, if you could help me uh, guide, guide us on how we could be practical in this. I do think this project of uh, digital connectedness of African universities is, is really essential and practicable and bankable, I would say. Uh, if we could get the right uh, guidance from you, the proposals uh, for what to do. Thank you. Thank you. Look, clear, clearly, uh, an hour is not going to do justice to this conversation. But unfortunately, we, we, we do have time limitations. Uh, but what I can say for certain is that we have begun a series of conversations. Uh, and uh, we, we've got the, the pointers in terms of direction of these conversations, but sadly for now, um, in preparation for the, the follow-on, I am going to uh, call on um, our Vice-Chancellor, Professor um, Tawana Kupe, um, to bring this session to a close. Um, as, as with uh, Prof Sachs, uh, Prof Kupe does not need any formal introduction, and he's been talking long through, through this particular dialogue. Um, but what, what I must say, though, is he's actually been immersed in the, the dialogue entirely for the past two days. Okay? Uh, he has been ever-present. He's been omnipotent within the conversations. And, and that's a very clear indication of his passion and his commitment. So the only introduction I will give is, here's our leader, and he continues to take us on a bold journey of reimagining and transforming and he's with us at the front line. Prof. Kupe. Thank you, Dr. Chixen. Colleagues, partners, friends, as we close this session, we also conclude the Investor Pretorius Inaugural Africa Week, where we assemble some of the finest minds 
and most tenacious champions of higher education from across our continent. In this gathering, we are all well aware that the institutions of higher education, which we represent, are an all an integral part of society, and that our very success depends on a world that is thriving, where human dignity and justice are paramount, all people are able to reach their full potential while nobody is left behind. And our development does not happen at the expense of our planet. We also recognize the critical role universities must play in securing the future of our continent. True to our African identity, we meet in a spirit of collaboration and transdisciplinarity, coupled with a deep concern for our humanity and for the common good of all people. Together, we face up to the challenges confronting us, resolving to own them and to address them with the, health of tal the wealth of talents we possess. We shared a compelling sense of belief that by mobilizing and harnessing our vast collective talents, we are surely up to the task of responding to the myriad challenges ahead. Through this Africa Week series of events, we affirmed our leadership and commitment to partnerships to build capacity in Africa and accelerating impact at a scale so that we still achieve the SDGs and Agenda 2063 in a post-COVID world. Over the past two days, we have navigated the complexity inherent to our sustainable development challenges, and we're forward-looking and future-focused as we reimagined universities as both sources of knowledge and education, as well as agents for societal development. Compounding our challenge is the reality that the complexity we live in is not static. It is dynamic and full of uncertainty, with unexpected and unpleasant surprises, as we so clearly saw with the COVID-19 pandemic. But in true testimony to our resolve, we turn threats into opportunities, and as we demonstrated with the COVID-19 pandemic, we did not let a good crisis go to waste. We reimagined, we adapted, we found new ways to continue fulfilling our purpose across all our different stakeholders. Within this broad and messy milieu, our conversations reinforce the imperative that in being responsive to changing societal needs, our positive impacts must be demonstrated in tangible and measurable ways. In the absence of making a compelling difference, our institutions become redundant and are replaced by ones which do. As a central challenge to development in Africa and with clear intent to be responsive to the continent's needs, we explored pathways of sustainable systems, sustainable food systems in Africa. Achieving our shared goal of zero hunger by 2030 remains difficult, and we know that it will only be achieved through working together to find ways to transform how the world produces, consumes, and thinks about food. We believe that our deliberations will provide a valuable contribution to the Food System Summit, which the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres will convene later this year. The process of reimagining is by its very nature creative and exciting as we envision our role and contribution to a future that we all believe in. Yet, at the same time, we are mindful of the hard work required to achieve the transformation needed to turn our good ideas and intentions into reality. While we are still grappling with the detail of the work ahead, we know that it entails a radical change effort. It includes examining our organizational structures and cultures to ensure that they are future fit and are enablers of agility, innovation, and responsiveness. Within our organizations, we need to understand and build the capabilities we need for the future and re-examine and redesign the processes we use in running our organizations and delivering our service offerings. Our hard and soft infrastructure may need to be adapted, upgraded, or repurposed to support our reimagined strategic intent. All of this needs to be done through leveraging technology and in a way where transdisciplinary and collaboration are embedded and how hardwired by design into our core functions of 
research, education, and engagement. In this transformation, we are charting new territory, and this ultimate success will be, out, be determined by our ability to learn and share knowledge with each other, collectively seeking an iterative and ongoing cycle of renewal and resilience. As we go forward, we'll maintain the momentum we have created. Our African Vice Chancellor's Forum forms the basis of a powerful guiding coalition, and we will continue to collaborate and strengthen the partnerships we have formed. For our part, the University of Pretoria will work on convening this as an annual event. We also put forward our four strategic transdisciplinary platforms, the Future Africa Institute, where I'm speaking from, Engineering 4.0, Complex, Javit UP Art Center, and Innovation Africa at UP as potential vehicles to enable our reimagined agenda. In the course of this year, we'll be strengthening a common and integrated approach across the four platforms for greater leverage and greater impact. We'll continue to push the boundaries with our African Global University Framework, and in May, we'll host the first Africa's first Nobel Prize Dialogues. The meeting will bring together Nobel laureates, opinion leaders, policy makers, students, researchers, and the public to engage in conversations on the future of work. The event will culminate in the launch of, of a center for the study of the future of work. Altogether, we have exciting times ahead. I would like to thank you all, partners, speakers, and panelists, moderators, all participants, and special thanks to our organizing committee for bringing this event to life. I urge you all to be part of the transformation, to be part of relentless pursuit for a better world. That is our calling. Thank you. <laughs>